This is George Fielding Elliott, CBS News, New York. Early this morning of April 19, 1775, CBS learned that General Thomas Gage, Commander-in-Chief of the British Army here in the American colony, has dispatched at least 800 of His Majesty's regulars from Boston to Concord. The Redcoats have been ordered to do two things, to seize the military supplies which the colonists have recently been storing in Concord, and to arrest Samuel Adams and John Hancock, the top leaders of the Sons of Liberty, the organization which is the spearhead of the colonial resistance movement. At this moment, the Redcoats are somewhere on the road to Concord. They left Boston by the Charles River crossing early last evening. And though General Gage... April 19, 1775, His Majesty's regulars march on Concord. You are there. New England, the delicate peace between the colonies and the crown feels the force of General Gage's march on Concord. Will peace survive, or will dawn find the colonies in open rebellion? CBS takes you back 174 years to the hour Paul Revere Road. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, CBS News, New York, and Major Elliott. To seize the military supplies the colonies have been storing there, to arrest Sam Adams and John Hancock comes as no surprise. General Gage could not possibly have afforded to wait any longer before striking a major blow at the growing colonial resistance to the town's authority. Not to move, and move immediately, would be to risk the effective establishment of a powerful colonial force dedicated to the ultimate destruction of King George's power in these colonies. The colonists had been protesting ever more vigorously against laws passed in England by Parliament without the consent of the colonies. They refuse any longer to be exploited economically by English merchants. Incident has piled upon incident. Violence has followed violence. The Continental Congress has crystallized political resistance. Now military resistance is crystallizing. Only recently, Patrick Henry, speaking in the Virginia House of Burgesses, said, the next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Goaded by epithets of insult, General Gage, tolerant, slow-moving, sometimes called the old woman, has finally accepted the challenge of the resistance. As for the colonists in Concord, there is no doubt that they are determined to keep their military stores as the legal equipment of local militia. The only question is, can the fragile peace, which still exists, survive the sparks that are even now being struck by the hobnails of General Gage's grenadiers on the road to Concord? Doug Edwards is ready to report from Concord, so over to Doug Edwards. I'm in Concord's town square in front of Wright's Tavern. It's still dark, but there's a bright moon. There are candles in the windows, torches on the square. The citizens have been awakened. The belfry bell has roused them from their beds. They're gathering here in the square, falling in under the command of Colonel James Barrett, and hiding supplies. They've been hiding them for three days. Apparently, their underground has warned them that General Gage would march. Here with me at our microphone is the man who brought the news of General Gage's march to Concord. He is Dr. Samuel Prescott, a town resident, rather young for a doctor, only 20 years old. Dr. Prescott, what is your opinion? Will peace survive General Gage's expedition? No, it can't, sir. We'll be in open rebellion before morning. Why do you say that, Doctor? Do you think there will be trouble here in Concord? Maybe yes, maybe no. There are 21 miles between Boston and Concord. There's Roxbury Town, Bedford, Lexington, Mystic, and dozens of others. In every one of those towns, the Minutemen have been pulled out of bed, and they're itching for a fight. They don't like the lobster bats, and the lobster bats don't like them. It looks like trouble, or does it? But, Dr. Prescott, there's been violence before, but no open rebellion. Yes, but this time it's different. You don't send 800 regulars to a tea party. Gage means to fight. You'll find us ready. You mean you'll fire on the redcoats when they appear? He will fire on no one unless they give us cause to fire on them. We've never fired first. They've always provoked us. We mean not to attack, but always to defend our rights as Englishmen. Dr. Prescott, would you mind telling us just how you came by the information that Gage's troops are on the mark? No, not at all. I was in Lexington last night. I went to see a young lady. As I was riding home, I met Billy Dawes and Paul Revere. Paul Revere, that's the Boston silversmith. That's right. Yes, and isn't Revere also the messenger for the Provincial Congress? I wouldn't know about that. Who sent him out? I haven't the faintest idea. I don't suppose you know where Sam Adams and Hancock are, either. No, I wouldn't, sir. Well, go on with your story. Uh, what did Paul Revere and Dawes tell you when they met you in Lexington? No, it was outside of Lexington. 
on the road to Concord. I was going to ride in with them to Concord, and we met four lobster bats. Cursed rebels, they called us. They said they knew we'd been rousing the militia, threatening to blow out our brains. They ordered us into a pasture. I took my chances, though. I spurred my horse over a stone wall by Polly Pond and shook them off. So did Billy. But they caught Revere, Lord Helsley. Where's Dawes now? I don't know. I'm sorry now. I can't answer any more questions. I've got to fall in with the minute man. Well, thank you very much. That was Dr. Samuel Prescott who brought the report that General Gage's troops are on their way here to Concord. You heard him say that, in his opinion, the colonies will be in open rebellion before morning. If he's correct, if rebellion does come, if the question if these local Minutemen can carry through successfully against the highly trained and well-supplied redcoats of His Majesty's forces. This Concord militia is a strange mixture of farmers, young boys, old men, and seasoned Indian fighters. None of them has a uniform. They're dressed in crude, homespun pants and cotton shirts. A few wear the familiar three-cornered hat worn in this section of the colony. But their battle gear is pathetically inadequate. Some have a powder horn slung over their shoulders and firelock muskets. A few have no weapons at all. Occasionally, some of them wander in and out of Wright's Tavern and partake generously of mugs of hot rum flip. Their women folk are helping with the stores. They're priming muskets, giving their husbands loaves of bread and salt pork and extra pairs of warm stockings. John Daly in Lexington, six miles from here, has just reported that the regulars have been sighted, so over to John Daly in Lexington. Here on the Lexington Green, in front of the Buckman Tavern, we can see His Majesty's regulars approaching on the Boston Road, about 300 yards off. The sun is coming up, and we can see them clearly, a mass of red-coated men, their officers marching on either side of the column and in front of it, too. I can't tell you yet who their commanding officer is, but it's probably Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith, because he's led these sorties for General Gage before. The fife and drum unit is playing Yankee Doodle, and as you can hear, playing it very badly, playing it very thoroughly. And that, no doubt, is a deliberate insult to the colonists. It's an old trick of the English regulars. They've done it before in Boston when they marched past the meetings of the Sons of Liberty. Captain Parker's militia is almost completely assembled, here on the green, over 60 of his complement of 75 men are already here, and latecomers are quickly filling in the ranks. The Minutemen are drawn up in a double line with their muskets at their side. If the decision is up to Captain Parker, there'll be no open rebellion here at Lexington. If Captain Parker had meant to challenge His Majesty's regulars, why, uh, he would have blocked the road to Concord. But instead, he has assembled his men here on the green, and he has given them very explicit orders not to fire unless fired upon. About 40 of the villagers, spectators, are standing about, leaning out of windows, idling in doorways, or swinging their legs on a stone wall. It hardly seems as if any of them expect trouble here. The big question now is, uh, what will the regulars do when they march to the fork in the road that leads to Concord? If they keep right on marching to Concord, well, then there'll be no trouble here this morning. Oh, there's Paul Revere coming out of the tavern. The British captured him but released him, and he returned to Lexington only a short while ago. Mr. Revere! Mr. Revere! Sorry, sorry, no time. Mr. Revere has gone right on by. He and another man are carrying a chest, and it doesn't look as if Paul Revere thinks there's going to be any trouble. He certainly wouldn't be so calm uh, carrying that chest across Lexington Green if he did. Well, the regulars, his majesty's redcoats, are almost... At the fork in the road now, they're a mixture of grenadiers in their high pointed caps and uh, light infantry. There are no field pieces, no artillery, since there was no prospect of a formal engagement when the Redcoats left their barracks. They hoped, as a matter of fact, to catch Concord completely by surprise, as you've probably been told. The Redcoats' ranks are orderly, and it's gleaming in the rising sun, the officers handsome as usual with their beautifully powdered wigs and their lace puffs. Many of the regulars we can see now, they're close up, are covered with mud from the waist down. They very evidently waded through some kind of mud country. And, oh, the commanding officer is not Colonel Smith. I can tell you that much. He's a younger man, uh, a major, in fact, by his uniform, and an officer not of the Army but of the Royal Marines. And I don't recognize him. The fights have stopped playing. The commanding officer has given the order to halt. The order is repeated down the long red line, and the major has ordered his men to pride and load. 
800 red coats are loading their muskets. We can't tell yet if the major seriously means to fire or if this is just a maneuver to intimidate Parker and the militia. Captain Parker hasn't moved, but some of his men are calling out. Some seem to think it's folly to stand here because they are hopelessly outnumbered, but there are others Quiet. who are against Red Red, and that's Quiet. Captain Parker talking now. Well, you heard Captain Parker. He told his men... The red-coated major has ordered his men up on the green, and they're advancing on the double. Bayonets at charge. Two platoons of three ranks each. Some of Captain Parker's militia have broken ranks, uh, are running away, but most of them are still there, standing at attention, muskets at their sides. His Majesty's regulars have, have halted now, their guns leveled at the double line of minutemen. The two opposing forces are face-to-face, rigid and resolved. That's the Major. He's galloped up on the green with two officers. Disperse, ye rebels, he cries out, ye villains. Disperse. Captain Parker's face is drawn, his lips are tight. He hasn't answered. Now, his men haven't moved. And that was Captain Parker. He's called out, break ranks. Break ranks. Order the minutemen to break their ranks. But the, the major, the major is ordering the dispersing militia to lay down its arms. Not satisfied with their dispersal alone, he's shouting at the minute men, waving his sword. Someone has fired a shot. I couldn't see where it came from. It seemed to come over from my left. It may have been one of the younger of his majesty's officers. The red coats have fired quick strikes the militia. Some of the Parker's men have fallen. Three of them. They're fired down now. The major is pointing his sword down with trying to prevent another fire from the red coats. The militia are firing back without a command, without any order of any kind. They're firing spontaneously with anger. The major force has been hit. It's rearing up. The spectators are running for cover as fast as they can. The women screaming. Everything is confusion, and the green is soaked with smoke. A red coat has been hit, but the militia has broken completely. They're fleeing in all directions. The both sides are firing freely. However, most of the firing is coming from the red coat. The red coats are running after the three minute men firing as fast as they can fly and reload. The major is still trying to stop his men from firing and to get some sense of order. But his men are out of hand. A minute man has just been standing on the spot because he refused to move. Some of the regulars are now trying to break the house and they're breaking down the door. There must be at least six minute men lying out there dead or wounded and still more have been wounded. I don't see any of Captain Parker's men now. They've all disappeared. The, the red coats are quieting down a bit. Their officers are slowly taking them back in the line of the road. Some of them are firing, however, when they think they see a surrender. The major is swearing at his men. His legs exploded in his hand. Don Hollenbeck in New York. Come in, Doug Edwards in Concord. Go ahead, Doug Edwards. We 
We don't know why Doug Edwards isn't answering our signal to Concord. We're trying to check. There's been an exchange of shots, as you've heard, between the Colonial Minutemen and His Majesty's regulars who are marching on Concord. CBS headquarters in Boston has been trying to get a statement from General Gage, but the general is not available for comment. However, our Boston headquarters has been able definitely to identify the major of the Royal Marines who is leading this expedition to Concord. He's Major John Pitcairn, 35. He lives in Boston, close to the house of Paul Revere. The entire contingent is under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith. Reports continue to come in claiming that the colonial militia in at least a dozen villages in the Boston area have been aroused and are marching toward the road between Concord and Boston. There's been no further information concerning the whereabouts of Samuel Adams and John Hancock. Both men are known, however, to be in the Boston area. We're still trying to reach Doug Edwards in Concord. And now, here is Major Elliott. The meaning of the tragedy that has happened on Lexington Green is still pretty obscure here in New York. Does this occurrence mean that there is no hope for peace? It's still much too early to decide that. The colonies are, of course, painfully familiar with other such bloody clashes. Clashes that have happened in the past. And still, there's been no open, organized rebellion as a result. Unless further investigation reveals that it was a militiaman who fired that mysterious first shot, John Daly's eyewitness account would certainly seem to indicate that Captain Parker's men obeyed his order not to fire unless fired upon. The militiamen seemed to have fired their muskets only in response to the concentrated volley of the regulars. However, when word of what has happened in Lexington spread through the New England countryside and the rest of the colonies, this word will certainly pour no water on the rising flames of resistance. And now here again is John Hollander. Thank you, Major Elliott. Ken Robertson, Concord, is calling in from a mobile transmitter. Go ahead, Ken Roberts. Are you getting me okay, Don? Yes, Ken, yes. Go ahead. Where are you? I'm on a hill outside of Concord. Where's Doug Edwards? He's inside the town. His Majesty's regulars have arrived. They've occupied Concord. We had transmission trouble before. That's why Edwards didn't get through. And when we were ready to report again, the regulars had moved in, taken over the town, and Lieutenant Colonel Smith had clapped down a tight censorship. I managed to get away from town in our mobile unit. I'm wearing a packed transmitter, and I'm here now at the Concord Militia, overlooking the North Bridge. What are the militia doing on the hill, Ken? Major Buttrick of Concord is conferring with his men. There are about 400 of them now. The men of Concord have been joined by others from Chelford, Carlisle, Littleton, and Bedford. They're trying to decide what to do about some smoke that's curling up from the center of Concord. The men don't know what's burning, but some of them are afraid the Redcoats have set their homes on fire and are trying to burn down the whole town. The only thing that's stopping them from going in immediately and finding out is the detail of redcoats down there at the North Bridge. There are three companies down there, all about 100 men, commanded by Captain Laurie of the 43rd Foot. That North Bridge is the only direct way back into Concord, and Captain Laurie's redcoats are blocking the way. That, that was Major Buttrick. He's given the command for the militia to fall in, and I think the Minutemen are going to try to cross the bridge. I don't know what Captain Laurie's orders are. I don't know whether he's been given any orders, but the big question is whether he'll let the Minutemen cross that bridge. We'll know any moment now. The Minutemen have struck up a march. I think it's the White Cockade. Two by two, they're approaching the bridge. I'm following the column. Major Buttrick is leading. Captain Davis, commanding the contingent from Acton, is walking at his side. All the men are walking steadily with great resolution. They're not speaking now. They're not looking to right or left. Their eyes are fastened on the regulars on the other side of the Concord River, watching the imposing mass of scarlet uniforms that sort of funnels into the entrance of the North Bridge. The regulars know the men and men are coming. Well, Captain Laurie has shouted a command of his men. I couldn't hear it. He's still too far away. But the red coats have taken up the traditional street firing formation. Three ranks, the men in the first rank kneeling, the second stooping, the third aiming muskets at eye level. It's a strange move. I don't understand it. If Captain Laurie means to start a fight, his men are jammed to the small bridge area right out in the open, and the regulars are also outnumbered three to one. Captain Laurie has ordered some regulars to rip up the planks of the bridge. He's going to try to stop the men and men from crossing. There goes one plank, another. That, that was Major Buttrick. He shouted angrily to the red coat to desist, to leave the planks. This is our bridge, Major Buttrick screamed. And the regulars have stopped. They've stopped tearing up the planks. The minute men are almost at the bridge now. The red coats are on the other side. Only about 75 feet or so of the Concord River separate the two groups. The 
minute men keep marching. And another... another... Three shots! The Redcoats fired three shots just now, and they, they splashed into the water. Another shot fired by a regular. Perhaps they're warnings. The minute men keep moving, though. Their man keeps playing. Well, that's Captain Lorry. news here. Heavy reinforcements of His Majesty's regulars have left Boston for Concord. Almost 1,000 troops under Lord Percy are moving along the road to Lexington. It's believed the request for those additional troops came by courier from Colonel Smith and now Major Elliott. A thousand fresh regulars on their way to Concord and the road swarming with newly arriving militia. These are fast-moving developments and they are certainly ominous. Can Lord Percy get past Lexington without a fight? And what are his orders? Are they merely to help Colonel Smith accomplish his original objective? Or has General Gage suddenly decided on stern measures against the gathering colonists? The situation certainly is growing worse at every passing moment. It seems sure that neither Minuteman nor regular wants war. And yet it seems that both are being forced into war by the dynamics of the struggle. Now, just a moment. Doug Edwards in Concord reports that Colonel Smith and his men have left Concord, heading back for Boston. Edwards is able to broadcast again, so cut in, Doug Edwards. The situation in Concord has been relieved for the moment, at least, but no one is sure exactly what's happened. The last of His Majesty's regulars that occupied the town has left. Whether it's for good, we don't know, but uh, they've left without any further bloodshed. So far, no arrests, no incidents after that one at North Bridge. All red coat details are rejoining the main body of troops, and then they began their march back to Boston again by way of Lexington. Seems strange that Colonel Smith and Major Pitcairn attempted no retaliation for what happened at the North Bridge. The search for military stores proved fruitless, rather embarrassing for the Redcoats. They seized a few barrels of flour, rolled them into the mill pond. They found some musket balls, threw them into the water too. Also, they spiked a few small cannon and burned their carriages. That was the smoke seen by Major Buttrick and his men. The town folk here are milling about around the taverns. Asking the big question, has Colonel Smith left for good, or does he intend to meet Lord Percy and return? The answer to that question is going to come soon enough, but even before Colonel Smith and Lord Percy meet, His Majesty's Redcoats, who have just left Concord, must pass through an area alive with angry, suspicious, nervous militiamen, their fingers itching on the triggers of their muskets. Can Colonel Smith run that gauntlet without trouble? We'll find that out in a matter of moments. John Daly, in a mobile unit, has now moved up from Lexington. He is now at an intersection on the road a mile from here called Merriam's Corner. The regulars are approaching, so over to John Daly. We've pulled into a cluster of trees overlooking the road from Concord. This place is known as Merriam's Corner because a local farmer by that name has his house here. The thousands of minute men who were awakened by Paul Revere and William Dawes and all the other messengers who spread the alarm are strung out on both sides of the road all the way to Lexington and possibly beyond. They're unorganized, they have no officers, but they've got plenty of muskets and powder. They're all keeping out of sight, crouching behind barns and rocks, standing behind trees and stone walls, and now and then you can spot a head bobbing out, but wherever they are, every minute man is watching that great cloud of dust approaching Merriam's Corner from Concord, the dust thrown up by His Majesty's regulars. The advance units of the regulars are in sight. They seem to be tired. No fife and drum plays them on. There's no music. They're carrying their wounded in chaises along the center of the road. 
Some of the infantry walk up on a ridge which slopes down and joins the main road here at Merriam's Corner. The redcoats are passing us now, moving into the ambush of Minutemen hidden on both sides of the road. The redcoats must know that the Minutemen are here, watching them, for they seem to be uneasy, uncertain of themselves. This is a tense moment which will decide if there's going to be another tragic clash here at Merriam's Corner. Nothing has happened yet, however, and the regulars are... One of the Minutemen has fired at the Redcoats. The musket was fired from a rock or tree to my right. The Redcoats are firing back, and from behind trees and rocks, the militia have opened up. Flashes of musket fire, clouds of smoke up. Nothing on the right. Look for the flash. Come on. The Redcoats are firing back, and from behind trees and rocks, the militia have opened up. Nothing on the right. The Redcoats are firing back, and from behind trees and rocks, the militia I'm falling, but they keep on marching because it's the only thing they can do. This is only the war. There's no doubt about it. It's open rebellion. The colonial militia fired first here without provocation by the red coat. But the militia has remembered Jackson and Dog Drake, and they picked up the gates of battle. The basket balls of the militia men here at Merriman's Corner are... April 19, 1775. The minute men fire first at Merriman's Corner... And open rebellion begins. You have been listening to Lexington, Concord, and Merriam's Corner. Another broadcast in the series, You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Sheehan. Lexington, Concord, and Merriam's Corner was written by Howard Merrill and Mr. Sheehan. Next week, April 12, 1861, Fort Sumter. You are there. Tonight, America's favorite schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks, goes to the dogs in her latest adventure on CBS. And to do the job up completely, the dog is, what else, a great game. You'll find unusual things happening and a vast amount of laughter when our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, finds that she's saddled with the welfare of a friend's great dame and has to take the cumbersome canine along to her classes. Also on CBS tonight, our other great Sunday feminine star, Helen Hayes, will be heard in the famous Broadway melodrama, Love from a Stranger. Eve Arden is our Miss Brooks, and Helen Hayes, star of the Electric Theater, comes to you every Sunday evening over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.